Okay, this is my least favorite part of the need to talk about saying my name. Um, all right, here we go. Yeah. I'm Greg Wells. I'm a musician originally from Canada. I've been in Los Angeles for over three decades now. And um, I started as a live musician, kind of anywhere that would have me, and then slowly sort of morphed into a studio musician who then slowly morphed into a record producer, mix engineer. I got started as a musician by just banging on the furniture in the little house I grew up in, um, as really as a, I mean, it sounds cheesy, but it's true. The truth is often cheesy as a baby. The first car seat I had as an infant, you know, would not pass any safety standards today. It had this weird, like, diagonal front to it that I think was made of styrofoam, and it sounded amazing. It was like this big kind of, like, cajon. That's what it sounded like. And I would hit it with my hands, and then at some point, I think around three years old, I got a little toy snare drum for Christmas, and I would use those sticks and play that uh, car seat all the time, driving my parents crazy. We had a, a used upright piano that my mom bought a couple years before I was born, and I would bang that as well with the little drumsticks and kind of like there's photos of me reaching up and, you know, one and a half, two, just kind of pl plunking away on it. And at some point I would, you know, realize I can play melodies on it and I would start picking things up by ear. And it just was like, I never ever thought, am I bad or good at it? That didn't matter because nobody around me did music other than like in church or just singing in the car to go somewhere. But I just knew that I really loved it. And I really loved rhythm in particular. I, my mom took me to see a Salvation Army Christmas concert. I still remember it, actually. We were in the balcony of the Peterborough, Ontario Salvation Army Church. And the percussionist who I am now friends with, I'm not sure if he's still alive or not, hopefully he is, his name is or was Murray Manders. He had a couple of timpani drums in front of him, kettle drums, and I didn't know what they were. And I just thought, oh my God, what is that? And it sounded amazing. And you know, those things, you know, if you ever go see an orchestra play and if you're sitting a good like 40 feet away from a huge drum, you really hear the low frequencies because those waves are so long. So the timpani sounded phenomenal, like however far away we were up in the balcony. And I just, I just started begging my mom when the concert was over, can I go like, just, can I just go look at those drums? Can we go up to the stage? Can I look at them? So I made a beeline for the stage and down the stairs and mom was running after me and I was just standing there staring at it. And he kind of saw me and I remember the stage was sort of high. It was high for me at three. He lifted me up and gave me a mallet and I hit it a couple of times and that was it. Then I started taking the bus going up to Toronto when I was about 14, 15, taking lessons there from some really serious teachers at the Royal Conservatory of Music and Marjorie Engels had moved to England at this point. Um, I started studying percussion with one of the percussionists with the uh, Toronto Symphony Orchestra, a guy named John Brownell. And then just really got obsessed with all music, all music. And I remember a Canadian show, TV show on the CBC, which is like the BBC, but Canada, it's like the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And the interviewer was interviewing, was doing a feature on the band Toto, which was a big Los Angeles, super successful band comprised of some of the best studio musicians that Los Angeles has ever seen. Two of those guys were being interviewed, uh, David Page, the piano player, and Steve Lukather, the guitar player. And at the end of that piece, I remember this uh, really affable, really friendly uh, woman was interviewing them. And she said, so do you guys have any advice for any like younger musicians that might want to follow in your footsteps? And I just sat up like, what are they going to say? And Steve Lukather was so cool. He was so matter of fact. And he was like, yeah, look at the records that you love, read the liner notes, figure out you know, who's playing on them, figure out where those records are being made and then move to that city and try to get to know those people. And I, I can still see him saying that his hair was had this like big kind of curly hair and these, these huge dark glasses on. Uh, and he just, he didn't even think about it. He just came out with that answer and it really stuck with me. And I started thinking at that point, I think I was about maybe, maybe I was 15 when I saw that. And I thought, I wonder if I'm gonna have to move to really pursue this, if I really wanna be involved in making records 
I wasn't sure. I didn't know. I didn't really know how to do this because I, I don't come from a family that does music professionally, you know, at all. You know, so I started meeting people in Toronto that, 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 that did. And a good friend of mine named Kira Payne, who unfortunately is not alive anymore, but she's from my hometown. She was a few years older than me. And she suggested that I apply for a government grant from the, something called the Canada Council for the Arts. And that might be a way to kind of dip my toe in the water in California, a place I had never been. It was a great suggestion. I did apply. I assumed I wasn't going to get it. But somehow I got it and um, I wound up coming here to study with Terry Trotter and Claire Fisher, two incredible, incredible musicians. I assumed I would go back to Canada when the grant money ran out and run out, it did. But the thing that happened, I had no idea was going to happen, is both of those guys started recommending me for studio work as a piano player. The best thing for me professionally was to come to Los Angeles. And I, and even then at the age of, I was 21 when I came here, I was so, I was just scared out of my mind, but I did have this sort of like feeling that this is a fishbowl I should plop myself in. It's the biggest fishbowl I've ever seen, but I feel like at some point I'm probably going to, probably going to swim beside some other fish that will know so much more than me, who I can learn some stuff from and maybe ask some questions to. And that happened slowly, you know, it's still happening. I still, I'm still super curious. And, 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 and now I get to be a fish that can help, you know, other people. Um, it's a good fishbowl for me to be in. Okay. So this studio that we're in right now is a studio that I've been trying to get built for four years now. I, I think we're done. I hope we're done. It became insanely expensive. It went way over time, way over budget, but I'm really happy with it. It is a mix room. It's a beautiful mix room. It's an Atmos mix room. It's an 1116 Atmos system. It's all PMC speakers. Uh, it's also a stereo mix room. It could be a mono mix room, uh, or it can be 5.1 or 7.1. And uh, behind me is a console made by Fix Audio, Paul Wolf who is a uh, brilliant guy who, uh, among other things, used to own API and designed a lot of the more modern API consoles. And he's just an inventor. He understands all kinds of stuff. I asked him if he could make me a console that was based on the Domitio modified API console in Studio One at Sunset Sound, which is just a magical sounding beast. And he has he's been inside of that console many times. And he knows kind of what makes it tick. And, and he said, yeah, uh, I can. And let's make it an Atmos console. So it's an analog Atmos console. It, it, there's, I think there's only one or two other ones out there on planet Earth at the moment. And I have a, all my analog hardware in here as well, almost all of it. And it's all connected uh, with Cat5 cable. I think it's Cat5, maybe it's Cat6 through Dante. One of the cool features of this console is there are many, many inserts on each channel strip and each one has a blend knob. So I can insert, you know, beside you is a 1950s RCA BA6A compressor, um, which just is just a magic box. I, I had one for years. I now went crazy and I have three of them. And the thought of like having three of them in a mix and then you can blend it in with the rich, just is, you know, option anxiety is crazy, but that's the kind of place this is. It's a crazy place. It's a complicated place when stuff doesn't work. It really doesn't work, but when it does work, it, it really works. Since I moved to Los Angeles in 1990, technology full stop has changed so much. Even, I mean, within the last five years, it's changed so much, but I think about it, electricity has been around for not much more than 100 plus years. I don't know what it is, maybe 130 years or something like that. We're really at the precipice of the beginning of it, like the dawn of the dawn of the dawn of technology. And I remember, you know, playing on recording sessions at any studio in Los Angeles, whether it was like kind of a 
you know, sort of a B minus studio to like the real flagship, amazing studios. And it was tape. There were no computers. It was all tape. That's just the way it was done. Uh, and the cool thing about that, unlike studios of today, where, you know, if the computer isn't working, all of a sudden you don't have a studio anymore. Nothing can happen. But in a, in a tape based room, if something breaks, you can still make music. Like if one of the channel strips goes down, or even if 10 of the channel strips goes down, or even if you lose like, five tracks in a 24 track machine you can still record you can still do stuff that was a nice upside of all of that but um you know i don't really record to tape anymore hardly ever sometimes i do i do love the coloration of tape in the same way that i love shooting on film cameras you know it, do it does this beautiful it's hard to explain what it does but i love what it does to sound you know Innovation and progress usually means two things, I think. It means faster and smaller. And the technology that's in a computer is the kind of stuff that I could only access if I was in a great studio. Automated faders on a console and outboard, you know, reverbs and delays. And, and now all of that stuff just shows up. You can get it on your phone which is amazing. It's amazing, but there's never been more technology to make it easier to sound good. And I've created some of that technology and I'm a fan of all of it. And then I started having an idea and I remember talking to my engineer of 10 plus years, Ian McGregor, about this wouldn't it be amazing to figure out a way because i'm still because i spent so much time in studios in the 90s with pull tech eqs and things that do that like big knobs you know um wouldn't it be great to figure out a way to automate that stuff and i then realized it was probably completely impossible and then i some i forget how i first heard about it but uh McDSP's idea of the APB was literally, sound, I mean, it sounded too good to be true to me. And I had to hear it, I had to know. So I got one and really put it through its paces and was really comparing to other analog gear that I have. And I now have bought four APBs and there's a reason why, there's a reason why. It's really incredible. It's really amazing what Colin has invented. Uh, the, the sonics of it are so insanely badass. And to have the luxury of pure analog signal path within the units doing their thing. Uh, and then to be able to control it from a plugin that feels exactly like a plugin, operates exactly like a plugin. It's really mind blowing. So uh, I sing their praises constantly. It has a lot to do with why I'm sitting in this chair right now. You know, I'm a fan. Uh, I paid for them. They were not free. And uh, people need to know about them. It's mind blowing stuff. It's really like we're in the future now in a big way. There's single rack space. You know, it's not some like huge gargantuan computer they don't take up much room and the sound is really something else it's just you know and it's a lovely admission also on it's really cool that that, that colin has been making software as long as he has been and you know it's the the old argument of like well does hardware sound better than software and today the disparity between those two things has never been smaller Software, software has never sounded better. The coding and the conversion has, it's so good now. However, to my ears, going through hardware as opposed to software, I hear like a 5% difference. Sometimes it's not worth it for me to care about that. Like in my tracking studio, that what used to be Butch Walker studio, um, that entire studio is run all software based. Good microphones, great instruments, and it sounds amazing. Like I've, I've compared the sound, really do a comparison of like what that sounds like going through the software as opposed to the hardware. And you can hear a difference. 
is it a big enough difference to warrant spending what you spend on the interfaces as opposed to buying $300,000 worth of analog gear or a half a million dollars worth of analog gear? No, no, it's not. The only thing I'm missing is a little bit of low end girth. A little bit of like harmonic, something going on down low, some like thickening something down low. And it's very subtle. It's very subtle. And I think that most people who are going to pony up and buy whatever music we're trying to make don't care and would not notice the difference. I notice the difference. And I think, I think, you know, God and the devil are in the details. I live in the world of three to 5%. That's a big number for me. It's not a small number makes a huge difference. Taking a mix to 95% and then taking to 100%, it sounds totally different to me. And I think, I think people would hear it too. It's a big difference. So, you know, running a mix in particular, like the finished product through a bunch of analog gear as opposed to only doing it in the box, for me, it's it's a more pleasurable experience. It's a luxury, you know? It's, it's, it's a luxury to be able to use analog gear. The world's most successful mixer Serban, he's all in the box. He's a good friend of mine. We have this conversation. We've had this conversation for years and years and years. He loves analog gear. He grew up, you know, recording a million bands using tape. And he's just really smart. He's just really great with balance. He doesn't even really do that much in his mixes. He's just, uh, just incredible with balance, like a great chef. He just understands a lot of the plugins that he uses today, he's been using for quite some time. Um, they just work for him and he just lets the music breathe and do its thing. And he can make the computer sound. I mean, let's put it this way. I've given him mixes that I've given to other mixers who did it all very analog. Uh, and in one case, it was actually a rock band. I gave it to like a really fantastic rock mixer whose work I love. And uh, for some reason, the band didn't like it. I did. I knew we weren't done, but I thought we were headed the right way. The band really didn't like it. We gave it to Serban. Serban's mix sounded like a herd of elephants running over the other mix. All done in the computer. It sounded warm, huge, big, like just did not sound like a computer mix at all. So everyone can arrive at this finish line differently. For me, I definitely need some analog stuff in the mix. It feels different to me. I can't explain it. I hear it's just, you know, I, I can't. It's hard to articulate unless you hear the difference. And you really do have to hear the difference. If you're able to A, B these things and compare volume matched and then see what you discover. And you just discover it for yourself. You know, I do this for a living. This is how I feed my kids. This is how I keep the lights on. It's very important to me. I am judged on the way this stuff makes people feel. And, you know, to use a cooking analogy, my food tastes better with the best ingredients when the when the best ingredients go into it. If I used crappier ingredients, I can try my best to make it sound, feel, taste better. But it's it's just easier. It's more forgiving when you just use the best stuff. That's actually, the, I should have said that 20 minutes ago. You know, it just is more forgiving when you use the best stuff. It's easier, it's faster, there's, there's less work involved.